All right, so now let's go and move on to quadratics. So we want to graph the quadratics and label the, the vertex. So in this case, we have y equals a x plus 5 quantity squared um, minus 1. So just remember when we're dealing like with the parent graph here, okay, a um, couple things I just want to kind of quickly review. So here's your quadratic, okay, and when we're talking about the vertex of the parent graph, it's at 0, comma 0, and we have f of x, let's just call this f of x, um, this is going to be at a a times x minus h quantity squared plus k. The vertex is the bottom or the top of your graph. And a lot of times we also will just represent that as your h comma k. Okay. Now, another way we could actually write this is x minus parentheses h squared. Okay. So that's kind of like a really important thing um, that I want you to kind of focus in on here because it's x minus h. So when you see a problem like this, a lot of students will say like, oh, five negative one is the vertex. And no, that's not the vertex. What you're simply going to do is write it in this exact same form. So if I do that, what I could write this as is an x minus a negative five quantity squared minus one, right? Because isn't minus a negative five positive five? Yes, it is. So that's going to be very helpful now. Now what we can do here is we can say, all right, h equals a negative five and k equals a negative one. So now I can write my vertex. So I'll just write, say vertex is going to be a negative five comma negative one. Um, this example, uh, we're basically going to do the exact same thing, the exact same. Uh, oh, do I supposed to graph it? Yeah, I said graph the function. Okay. Um, now in this example, so let's go ahead and do a quick little graph. Um, so what I'm simply going to do now is just take this parent graph that I made, which I made kind of too big. But what we're going to do is take this parent graph and now we're going to shift it five units to the left and then one unit down. One, two, three, four, five, and then one unit down. Okay, now it's important that the understand from about quadratics, if your teacher is wanting you to kind of get um, kind of like dialed in or like really good on your graphing, that the graphs go up one over one, right? So you have this point, up one over one, and then you go up two, up four. So one, two, three, four. So up two, up four, up two, up four. Okay, because right, if you said like two, two squared would be four, right? Negative two, negative two squared would be four. So that's kind of the relationship that that graph is going to be um, kind of taking. So I'm just gonna follow that exact same pattern. So I went left five, down one. So I can go left one over one because there is no stretch or compression of this graph. So that's what that graph would look like. And that is going to be my vertex here of negative five comma negative one. All right, um, and also it's gonna be opening up because my A, which is a one, right? You can technically, my A is a positive one. So therefore there's no stretch or compression, but the graph is going to be opening up because it's positive. Now in this example, um, what I want you to see is that the A is now negative and it's actually being vertically compressed. So what's happening is um, when I go over one, instead of going up one, it's only going up one half. Right? So when I go over two, instead of going up four, it's only going up two. But actually we're not going up, we're going down because it's negative, right? When you have a negative, that's gonna be forcing it down. So hopefully you recognize the vertex here is going to be a negative three, positive two. Um, the graph is going to be very similar to the one we just did. So we're just gonna go one, two, three, up two, okay? But now if you just, if you have to be a stickler, you know, again, as I mentioned, remember the other one was over two, it'd be down four. Well, this one, you're going to go over two, down two. So it'd kind of be, it's going to be a little bit more, this is what we call a vertical compression. And again, since my A is negative, that's going to be forcing this graph to go down. So you can see how this one's a little bit wider, it looks like, or vertically compressed. All right. Um, another thing that I would probably say is like one of the hugest things that you absolutely need to know um, for this guys is two factor, like factoring comes up time and time and time again in pre-calculus. So you're just gonna have to get really, really good at factoring. Um, so one thing to recognize whenever you have a difference of two, whenever you see two terms quadratic, just, you know, think about difference of two squares, difference of two squares, right? And again, that relationship is whenever you have the form of a squared minus B squared. So the first term is squared and the last term is squared. And that's a difference of those two terms. Remember that's a minus B times a, a plus B. Okay, so what's the square root of x squared? Well, that's just going to be an x, right? So you could say a is equal to x. Well, what's the square root of 49? Well, that's going to be a 7, right? So now I can write this as a x minus 7 times a x plus 7. And voila. Um, now, in this case, again, something else is important we recognize here. Again, we have the first two terms, which is a square number. 
right? So that you can rewrite that as an X squared and you can rewrite 64 as a square number, right? That's a eight squared. So when the first term and the last term are squared, think difference of two squares if it's two terms or think of a perfect square trinomial if the middle term is two times your first term and times your last term, right? So that two times X times eight. <clears throat> and again, does that work? Yes, it is a 16. Now again, the negative, all that's gonna tell you is that the binomial needs to be a, also negative. So therefore this form is gonna be an X minus eight times an X minus eight. Okay, and that's how that works because negative eight times negative eight is positive 64. Negative eight X plus a negative eight X is going to be a negative 16. And we can rewrite this as a X minus eight quantity squared. Now the next one, um, now we're gonna be looking at is, now you notice that my last term is not a square number, right? So now what I'm gonna do is basically just say, all right, what two numbers multiply to give me 21, okay? And you have 21 times one. And a lot of times guys, you remember you need to do this in your head. And a seven times three. <clears throat> Now, whenever the last number is negative, what you're going to do is look at the difference. Okay. So when the last number is negative, what you, uh, what I want you to think is negative is difference, right? So look at your factors and say, which of these factors have a difference of your middle term, which is four. Well, obviously you can see that's seven and three, right? Those have a difference of four. Now, since they have a positive difference, that means my seven has to be positive and my three has to be negative. One of them has to be negative though, because when you multiply seven times three to make that a negative 21, one of them has to be negative. But since the difference is positive, the larger of the two factors is going to be your positive factor. So therefore the factor form of this is to be X plus seven and an X minus three. Now in this example, um, this one gets a little bit more difficult. So the main thing I want you to recognize about this is, you know, all quadratics, all quadratics can be broken down into a product of two binomials. So you always want to see if you can factor something out, which in this case, unfortunately we cannot, but we do know, like if I was to multiply this out, right? If I was going to use foil, I could have a two X times an X, right? And you know, that would work to give me that two X squared. Now for the 12 though, we have options. So we have a 12 times one. Um, we have a six times two and we have a four times three. Now, Again, we're looking at a negative, right? So we're thinking about the difference, but none of these have a difference of five. Well, and that's for a good reason because what we're actually looking for is we're looking for the products of my inner and my outer to have a difference of five. So now what we're doing is kind of doing a little mental math. Like if I did a two X, if I put a 12 here, two X times 12 would be a 24. Oh, I need to, what am I gonna multiply X by to get it to be a difference of five, right? That'd be like, I need to get to 19. That's gonna be kind of difficult. So I kind of maybe think about, well, if I did a, what about if I did a two X times four, that'd be an eight and eight and three, right? Cause then a three times X, well, that would give me a difference. And like, yeah, that'd work. Now, since my middle term is negative, my larger of my two products, either my inner or my outer needs to be negative. So two X times a negative four is going to give me a negative eight, right? And then a three positive three times X gives me a positive three, right? So I have a three X. Uh, and then I'm going to add that to a negative eight X that should give me a negative five X. Do you see how that kind of works here? And then obviously my first two terms needs to give me two X squared and my last two terms needs to give me a negative 12. So again, guys, it just takes some practice, but that's why we are working through all these examples. So in this example, you can see we have some larger numbers, right? But you always want to look to see if there's something you can kind of, you know, easily factor out first. And you hopefully you recognize here that these all are all these terms, the five X squared, the 40 X and the negative 10 are all divisible by five. So therefore I can take out a five. Uh, when I divide out a five, I'm gonna be left with a X squared plus a eight X minus a two. Now, unfortunately though, this is not gonna be factorable any further because you know, if I had like a two, like what two numbers multiply to give me two? Like two and one, like that's my only option. I'm never gonna be able to get an eight, right? So then this is just gonna be our factored form. Now, obviously when we get into solving, we could actually use like completing the square or quadratic formula. But again, for right now, we're just trying to factor out our terms. And again, we always want to look for terms that they have in common. So here's another example of saying like, all right, what does a 24 and a, you know, 54, like what do these, you know, have in common? And to me, it looks like we can divide out a three. So if I divide out a three, that's going to give me an eight X squared and divide out a three here, that's going to give me a minus an 18. So actually I could probably do a six, right? Yeah, I should have done a six. So you could do a three, but then you're going to divide out another two, right? So why don't we just go from the six in general? Cause we want to get this to the most factored form. So if I go ahead and factor out a six, right now, it's going to give me a four X squared and then a six, <clears throat> six times nine is going to give me a 54. 
Okay, now you can see I can further different um, factor this down. This is the difference in two squares, right? I have a squared term minus another squared term. So the way that I can factor this would be a 2x minus 3 times a 2x plus 3. Okay, so even if something like, <clears throat> if you didn't recognize a 6 at first, like pick something, right? Usually a 3 or a 2 or a 5, you know, those are kind of easy. And then if you can further factor it down, you'll kind of notice what other terms you can kind of do. Um, and then you, then you can kind of go back and redo it again. Right. But also again, look for that special factoring technique. This is an example where we're actually able to factor out multiple terms. Um, you know, factor out not just the common number, but then do a difference in two squares. And then in this example, um, again, we know that binomials, I'm sorry, trinomials can be brought written down as a product of two factors. So therefore I can rewrite this as a two X times X. Okay. Now I'm trying to get a 12. Now notice the 12 here is positive. So when I'm writing down my factors of 12, I'm going to have a 12 times one, right? A six times two and a four times three. Well, now what I'm doing is I'm trying to look for the sum of these to be able to add to give me an, a negative 11. But again, it's not the sum of the factors because I have a coefficient here of my X squared. So it's going to be the sum of these two products, right? So two X times what plus a X times what is going to give me negative 11. And again, those what's are going to be over here. So again, since this is a positive, that means my two factors have to be the same, have to be the same signs. So what I notice here is, and they also have to be negative since my middle term's negative. If I do a two X minus four, right? That's going to give me a negative eight. And if I did an X minus three, right? So that's a negative three X. And then that's going to be plus a negative, uh, not negative eight. That's going to be negative four X, right? So a negative four X and you can see that that is going to add to give us a seven, which is not, I'm sorry, two times four. That's an eight. I'm making some mistakes here. So negative three X plus a negative eight X is going to give me a negative 11 X. Okay. So you can see how that's going to, um, work in that regard. So, and then, yeah, that's going to be your factored form. And again, you can always check the first two terms, right? Two X times X is two X squared. And you can also multiply negative three times 12 and it's going to give you a positive 12. So you can see how that works out. Um, all right, now, so factoring is very important because we're going to not just do factoring in quadratics. It's going to expand to polynomials, rational functions, trigonometric functions. Um, but also we would need to make sure that we can factor or I'm sorry, solve quadratic equations. So like what we did with our radicals using the inverse operations, that's exactly the same thing we're going to do for the quadratics. Like if you only have one term, if you only have one term squared, you can use your inverse operations. Um, <clears throat> So basically what that means is just undo what's happening to the variable. So in this case, we're going to multiply by two on both sides and I get a X squared is equal to a 16. Now it's very important though to recognize that you can only use your inverse operations when you have that squared isolated, right? And when you take the inverse operation of the squaring, that's going to be the square root. You have to make sure you include the plus or minus. So the square root of 16 is going to be a plus or minus a four. Okay. So you have to make sure you include both of those solutions. And again, this kind of goes back to our, options for quadratics, right? A quadratic can have one X intercept or one solution. It could have two solutions, right? Or it could also have no solutions. So that's a little bit different than the square root function, right? When we were dealing with the square root function, you could have no solution, but you also could have one solution, right? But there was no way that we were going to have like more than one solution going up. Um, <clears throat> now let's go and take a look at, um, this example. Now, again, this example noticed I only have one X, right? So what I'm going to do here, before I take the square root, I need to isolate this. So to isolate this, I'm going to add a 12 to both sides. When I do that, I get an X plus five. Quantity squared is equal to a 12. Now I can go ahead and take the square root. So I'm going to take the square root on both sides. That's going to leave me with a X plus five equals the square root of 12. Now we've simplified the square root of 12 here already. That's just going to be a two radical three. But again, remember we introduced the square roots. So that's a plus or minus. So be careful. Make sure you're always including that. So X is going to equal a negative five plus or minus a two square root of three. And that's going to be your final answer. Again, we have our two answers here. Now, one of the big mistakes that students will make here is they get a problem like this and they say, oh, let's go ahead and take the square root to both sides. Don't do that. Please do not do that. Okay. Um, what I want you to do in this case is whenever you have a quadratic and you have more than one X, in this case, you have an X squared and you have a linear X. <clears throat> What I want you to do is get them all over to the same side. You have to have your quadratic equation equal to zero. So we want it in our standard form, AX squared plus BX plus C. Again, if you have only one X, use inverse operations. But when you have more than one X, you have to go ahead and set it equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get everything over on the right-hand side. 
just over to the left hand side. And I'm going to put it in standard form here. So I'll have an x squared minus a 3x minus 4 is equal to 0. Okay. Now, the first thing I want to do is check to see if this is factorable, right? What two numbers multiply to give me negative 4 add to give me a negative 3? Well, that's not too bad. That's going to be an x minus 4 times an x plus um, a 1. And that equals 0. Now we have a product equal to a 0. So therefore, we can apply the 0 product property, right? So I can say x minus 4 equals 0 and an x plus 1 equals 0. So now I can say x equals 4 and x is now going to equal a negative 1. In this example, it's already set equal to 0. So we're basically going to apply the same approach. You know, what two numbers multiply to give me 6 are going to add to give me a 5. And we recognize here that, hmm, that doesn't work, right? Like there's no two numbers that multiply to give you 6, add to give you 5. But that's if you're thinking about 6 and 1. So a lot of students will think, oh, 6 and 1, that doesn't work. But what about 3 and 2? Right? Remember, there's multiple factors. So that's why I think it's always helpful to kind of write down all of your factors. Um, because when you're looking at this last term as positive, you're looking for the sum of your two factors to equal your middle term. And that's why 3 and 2 are going to work. So this one could be a x plus 3 times an x plus 2 quantity squared, and that equals 0. Therefore, now I can say x plus 3 equals 0, x plus 2 equals 0, and therefore x equals negative 2. No, x equals a negative 3. Then here, an x equals a negative 2. I think I was just kind of switching them up. Uh, on this next example, again, we're going to be looking at the same thing here. Um, as far as uh, trying to see if it's factorable. Now, again, I want to be able to see, can I rewrite this in factored form, right? So I have a 2x and an x. Now, again, here, forget about the negative just for a second. Let's do 7. That can be a 7 times 1. Well, again, if I want a difference of 13, like, if, if I did it, like, just think about it. If I put a 7 here and a 1 here, right? 2 times two times 1 is 2. 7 times, you know, 1 is going to be 7. That's have a difference of 5. That's not going to work, right? So... I do recognize though, when I do two X times a seven, that gives me a 14 X. That's really close to a 13 X. And then also, you know, this there, um, one times X is going to give me that one X. That's going to give me that difference. Now, since my middle term is negative, I want my larger of my two products, my inner or my outer, right? To be negative. Well, the larger of the two products is going to be the two X times seven. So that's a negative seven and that's going to be a positive one. Okay. But again, now we're trying to solve. So now I can set these both equal to zero using the zero product property. And therefore I get X equals a negative one half. And here X is going to equal a positive seven. Um, now in this example, uh, again, make sure you are setting it equal to zero. So you subtract the one on both sides and I get an eight X squared plus a two X minus one equals zero. And again, in this case, what I want to simply do is now, now here we kind of have some options, right? So you could say, um, I could do an 8x times x, or I could do a 4x, right, times a 2x. And again, my options for a negative 1, um, you know, what two numbers multiply to give me negative 1? Well, you know, I only have a negative 1 times positive 1, right? Um, now, it looks like here I can get a difference of 2 if I went ahead and said, well, and again, I want that difference to be a positive, right? So if I did a 4x plus 1, and then put a negative one right here, I think this would work. And again, let's just check your work. 4x times 2x is an 8x squared, right? Negative one times negative one is going to be a negative one. This is going to give me negative 2x, right? This is giving me a positive 4x. And you can see that, hey, yes, it does work. So now I can set them both. Actually, let's do it over here. Yeah, we got to room. So 4x minus one equals zero. And a 2x plus one is equal to zero. And now I can see x is going to equal a 1 fourth. And here, x is going to equal a negative one half. And again, all I'm doing is just using my inverse operations to solve for them. Okay, um, now it's going to work on these two examples. So again, kind of same idea. Again, don't use inverse operations. Notice how we have two x's. Let's get everything over to the same side. So let's add a 9x and let's subtract a 2. Okay, so therefore I'm left with a 3x squared. Um, let's see, plus a 9x minus a 2 equals 0. Okay. Now, again, I'm looking into factoring this out. Like, is this factorable, right? What can I multiply here? A three X times an X to equal a zero. So in this case, um, <clears throat> we need to get a negative two and I'm starting to come into, you know, some problems here. Like if I do a negative two, negative two times three is a six. Like I would have to add that to a three to give me nine. Like, I don't see that that is going to be factorable. I don't see there's anything I can multiply here by my factors of two to get me to a nine X. 
So therefore, in this problem, I'm going to need to apply the quadratic formula. If you remember the quadratic formula, x equals a opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus a 4 times a times c all over a 2 times a. So again, remember that comes from our standard form of ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. So in this case, we could say a equals 3, b equals 9, and c equals negative 2. So the nice thing about the quadratic formula, I mean, I still think factoring is going to be their fastest, easiest way for you to be solving quadratics, but you should be able to adjust if something is not factorable, which is going to happen. You need to be able to, how, how, you need to be able to identify these values, A, B, and C, and then plug them into this equation. So when you go ahead and do that, that's going to be a negative nine plus or minus a square root of nine squared minus a four times three times C, which is a negative two. Am I running out of room? So yeah, let's go ahead and move that over. Sorry about that. Apologies. No, not the two. We can bring you back over. Okay. And then again, remember that's going to be all over my two times a, which in this case is going to be a three. Okay. So now we just need to go ahead and simplify, clean things up basically. So a nine squared is going to be a 81. Okay. And then in this case, I have a three times, um, Three times negative two, which is a negative six. Negative six times a negative four is going to be a positive 24. And this is going to be all over a six, right? So therefore I can rewrite this as a negative nine plus or minus. Now, um, 81 plus 24 is going to be a hundred and five. And then that's going to be all over six. And I'm not sure if there's anything else I can simplify that square root. I'm just trying to think of some numbers in my head, square numbers in my head that would evenly divide in 105 and I'm kind of coming up with a blank at the moment. So I believe that is going to be your simplified version. Now in this example, we can do exam again, the exact same thing. Like what two numbers, right? Can we factor this out, right? Always look to factoring first. So we have a three X and an X. We again have that last term to be a negative two. And again, we want a difference of two. Um, and you know, no matter what I do, I'm not going to get a difference of two multiplying this. It doesn't matter if I put a two here, a one here, a one here, a two here, I'm never going to get that difference of two. So therefore, again, I need to use the quadratic formula. So in this case, my a equals three, my b equals two, and my c equals negative two. So let's go ahead and again, try this out. So I have x equals opposite of b. So that's going to be negative two plus or minus a square root of a b squared. So that's going to be two quine squared minus a four times b times c, which is negative two, all divided by a two times a, which is three. Okay. So what we have here is a negative two plus or minus. Now let's go and clean this up. Two squared is going to be a four. Okay. And again, we have the same thing here. Um, four times three times negative two is going to be a positive 24. So that's going to be a positive 24 and that's going to be all over six. All right. So I'm going to kind of bring this back down over here. So let's see here. I have a negative two um, plus or minus. Now this is going to be square root of 28 all over six. Now square root of 28, I want to see what square numbers evenly divide into 28. You could say four, right? Four goes into there. So we have a negative two plus or minus. Um, let's see, square root of four is going to be two. Two, or sorry, four times seven is 28, right? So it'd be seven, and then that's going to be over a six. Now the reason why I had to simplify that because I'm kind of running out of room, but now I can divide a two in the top and all the bottom. So therefore that's going to give me a negative one plus or minus a square root of seven over three. So basically what I did out of all three of these terms, I divided out a two. All right, now let's go and take a look at the completing the square. So the main thing we're completing the square is this is actually another technique we can use to write an equation from standard form into vertex form. It is a solving technique. I prefer either to look at factoring or go into quadratic formula, but you can also use completing the square for solving. I think it's just, I think it's a good, very helpful for rewriting my equation. I don't really like to use it for solving as much, but the main idea that we're trying to do is find the value C that completes the square. So to find the value C, basically all we're going to do is C is equal to a B divided by two quantity squared. All right. And our goal here is to create what we call a perfect square trinomial, which can be factored down into a binomial squared. So, what we want to do is we want to see if you remember when we were factoring, I think the second example I did in the factoring was I found a perfect square trinomial. And what that means is that could be factored down into a binomial squared. Now this is not a perfect square trinomial because eight is not a square number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a perfect square trinomial um, and we need to label the vertex. Okay. So I remember labeling the vertex y equals a times x minus h quantity squared plus k, right? So I remember the vertex is your h comma k. Okay. Important to remember that. 
All right, so what I'm gonna do is inside the parentheses, I am going to create a perfect square trinomial. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the value C that completes the square. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my B, which in this case is negative four. So take a negative four divided by two, squared. So negative four divided by two is a negative two, negative two squared is gonna equal a positive four. I'm gonna take this number and add it inside my parentheses. Now remember, whatever you do add inside your parentheses on one side of the equation, you have to either add it to the other side of the equation or subtract it on the same side. So if I add four, I'm just gonna subtract a four outside the parentheses and that's plus eight. So now what I'm gonna have here is a X minus two times an X minus two, right? If you practice your factoring, right? This you, what you do whenever, every single time you create, do the perfect square trinomial, you always create a perfect square trinomial. So when I have an X minus two times an X minus two, that's gonna give me an X minus two quantity squared, okay? And then negative four plus eight is just gonna give me a positive four. I don't know why I wrote an equals, but that's supposed to be a plus four. So I'm just gonna go ahead and write a plus four in this case. And that's not supposed to be there. But again, you what you can see here is this is gonna be an X minus two times X minus two, which is going to leave me now with an X minus two quantity squared plus four. And if you remember the vertex here in this case is going to be now a two comma four, right? Because it's X minus H, right? So therefore the minus two actually shifted it to the right two. Um, in this example, we're just going to, you know, it's just basically, again, practicing the completing the square. Completing the square does come up, so it is very important that you can, you know, practice this and feel comfortable with this process. Um, in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, group these first two terms. And actually, let's just figure out what my B is in this case. So my B in this case is going to be a negative 10. So I could say C equals a negative 10 divided by 2 quantity squared. A negative 10 divided by 2 is a negative 5. Negative 5 squared is going to equal a 25. Okay, so I'm going to add that and subtract it. So I have a y equals a x squared minus a 10x plus a 25 minus a 25 and then minus 1. Okay, now here again, this is a perfect square trinomial. What two numbers multiply to give me 5, add to give me negative 5. And again, they're going to be exactly the same. In this case, that's going to be y equals a x minus a 5 quantity squared minus a 26. And now we can say my vertex here is going to be a positive five comma a 26. Now it's like example, a lot of students will get confused here because they'll be like, oh, fraction. I don't want to do fractions. Like that looks confusing, right? But again, just follow the steps, right? We want to group our first two terms. Okay. Group the first two terms and then find the value C that completes the square. So C in this case is a negative three divided by two quantity squared right? Well, negative three divided by two, it, or you can't divide that out, but you can square it, which is going to be a nine fourths. Okay. So I have y equals a x squared minus a three x plus a nine fourths. Now that looks kind of confusing. Minus a nine fourths and then plus a seven fourths. Well, the good thing here is at least I added it with another fraction. That fraction is actually helping us out because now I can combine those rather easily. However, how do you factor this out? So the one thing I want you to kind of understand here is when, when you have a perfect square trinomial, um, when you have it like a X squared plus um, a two B X plus X squared. Okay. When I want to try and find my X, uh, actually, I don't really want to go far that way. Um, the best thing I hear, I can explain to you this way. The best way, if you want to know what this binomial squared is going to be, it's going to be X plus or minus a B divided by two squared. Okay. Now again, the plus or minus just means is your middle term going to be negative or is your middle term positive? Actually, I chose all negative examples. So our middle term is always going to be negative. So what was my B divided by two? My B divided by two is a negative three halves. So therefore, since my middle term is negative, I want to use this negative solution. So I can rewrite this as a X minus a three halves times an X minus a three halves. Now, again, you could write it back in the square term, right? But I want to show it to you how this works. And then this is going to be a negative two fourths. Oops, I'm sorry. We already have that as a negative, right? So it's going to be minus a two fourths. Okay, so here's what I want you to be able to do and see how this works. Negative three halves times negative three halves is a positive nine fourths, right? Negative three halves plus negative three halves is a negative six halves, which is a negative three. So you can see how this works. So therefore, this is going to be X um, minus three halves quantity squared minus a one half. So the vertex in this case is a fraction, right? But it's going to be a positive three halves and then minus a one half. 